Okay, so I'd like to welcome our second speaker tonight. Not quite rock steady, far more advanced, a bit rock steady, but we're not split hairs. Um, our second speaker is Pauline Gallagher from the Nielsen Community Development Trust. She was instrumental in uh, creating the first urban based community asset. You know, at a time when people were buying islands and moorlands and putting up wind farms, actually it's securing assets in our, in our rural, in our, not our rural, in our towns and our cities is an important feature. So, um, Pauline's background is in architecture and planning, probably very, in very instrumental in your um, idea of creating uh, spaces. I'd like to hear from yourself if you can welcome Pauline. Hello, hello. So, you live in Nielsen, yep. which is a, a village of about 6,000 people outside Glasgow. That's right. How long have you been there? Are you from there? Oh dear, this is where I feel my age, 40 years. And, um, yeah, counting. You don't look a day over 40. Yeah, yeah. You've been there 40 years. What took you to Nielsen? Place to live. I um, got married. There was a little mill house to live in, and uh, that's where we went, and that's where we lived, so it's been good. Now, you're a trained planner and architect. Well, I can't yeah. claim. I, I, no. I, I, my plea is that I couldn't put up a garden shed. I only, <laughs> did, I only did a part one, but it was enough to cement my enthusiasm for placemaking. But you can draw? A bit. A bit. <laughs> um, and how do you think that's fed into, that background, that training, fed into what you've been doing over the years? What's well, been the absolute root and uh, fun fundamentals of what I've been um, doing since. And I, I've had a very... Um, unconventional trajectory because uh, having done the, the part one architecture I then got the opportunity to run um, design training courses for housing association clients which is where I'd started my work working life. What's design? Well design? it's an interesting one and it, you know it may speak to people in the audience that people are expected to go on training for everything to do with business plans, um, you know being an employer, uh, being you know doing good governance um, but when it comes to design, no one ever thinks that you that you need some training in that. You're just expected to be a, an expert client because you happen to live in a house. And what we what we were doing in in Designs on You was to say to housing association committee members, do you know there's a world of of design and and thought about housing in this case, mm -hmm. um, which can take you beyond. The awareness that you have just now. So we went to Copenhagen, we went to Amsterdam Handy. with housing association committee members, uh -huh. and for some people that really was a, a, a real moment of, of transformation. So, so much so that when Glasgow's City of Architecture and Design was being pitched for, mm -hmm. the UK City of Architecture and Design was being pitched for, it was the work that was being done around that, um, actually on the ground. Um, developing aspiration around with people for their place that actually to some extent swung it for Glasgow mm. because he, here we were actually doing this, we were taking architecture and design out to ordinary people who ordinary weren't, profe people. weren't professionals. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of the And how did they get involved? Um, the ordinary people? Well they were on the housing association committee oh, committees okay. and that was the first the starting point. Um, the 99's community programme was actually <laughs> nothing more, nothing less than the whole of Glasgow. And so we ran a programme which attempted, with varying degrees of success, to um, engage people around the issue of um, making better places, essentially. So they were involved in designing the houses and the estates that they were living in? Well, I mean, not, not during the festival, because clearly it was a one-year yep. long programme and there were extreme limitations to what you could do in, uh, in that time. But that was the premise that, in fact, the more people were engaged in thinking about place, thinking about design, the, the more aspiration and more ambition they had when it came to asking for better places. Um, you know, if, if there's only one colour car on the market, well, you don't ask for a pink one because mm -hmm. it's a black one, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. So um, it's about that widening of aspiration in the same way as, as you know, all the other social entrepreneurs have their passion. Mine was about place making and the fact we should not be accepting the kind of banal environments which we're handed, uh, especially in places of social disadvantage. Mm -hmm. If you live in, a, um, in, in the Georgian U town, you can be absolutely sure that um, those places will be cared for and cherished because they are seen to be um, a, a precious environments. Mm -hmm. When it comes to our, our little towns and, and villages, 
uh, and some of our housing estates, those have never been precious environments. Mm -hmm. They may be precious to the people who live there because that's where their social networks are, but in terms of those who are ch people who are charged with creating, uh, giving us our built environment, um, you, you know that the attention that can be paid is sometimes skewed. Uh, some places matter more than others, and that's my passion. Every place matters. Every place matters. And people's voice matters. Absolutely. And is that what got you interested in creating a community development trust? Well, in there, was a, there was an interim stage where, after Glasgow 1999, um, I got the chance to have a Nesta Fellowship. Um, at that time, Nesta Fellowships were um, a, a allocated according to some kind of arcane. Uh, um, mechanism, and I happened to get one. It came through the ledger box, literally. Um, How well fashioned! <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and and what what was I to do with this? Well, I actually wanted to build on the experience of 1999, mm -hmm. which I had to have to say was a very um, fractured experience because you know, architecture and design, you know, is is kind of out there somewhere. People see it as something that's quite actually quite elitist, quite a feat. Um, and for, well, for me, it's about the very substance of our lives. Um, and so I wanted to look at some of the projects that we've done in 99 and actually look at how our, our well-intentioned attempt, uh, intentioned attempts to make good places mm -hmm. were either successful or not. So I got a chance to do that in the, during the Nesta uh, Fellowship. Mm -hmm. And I wrote this little uh, book. Uh, I call it a bouquet because it's really not a big volume. Um, a book's a book. So you're an author. <laughs> you're an author as well as an architect. Um, on it's called Everyday Spaces, and uh -huh. it was actually interrogating these five spaces that we had actually created, w along with community clients, um, to see um, well what was going on there. And so it was an incredibly fruitful experience for me to say that actually, if you want to look at placemaking in the kinds of neighbourhoods we all work in. Mm -hmm. You have to ask, what is the life of this place? Mm -hmm. What 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 happens now in the main street? You know, as opposed to fifty years ago, mm -hmm. when these places, a hundred years ago, when these places were built. And so that was very fruitful for me, and it set me off on the Nielsen project. Oh. And what sort of te we'll come to the Nielsen project, but I'm interested in the the techniques and the toolkit, as it were. What what type of toolkit do you have to have these dialogues? In in with places. communities, yeah, about well, their, the design of their spaces. Well, what we did was we had a, fun, uh, a fund called the Partnership Fund, which was actually people coming in and looking for money to do things in their, in their places. So mm -hmm. that could be anything from lighting up a, a um, water tower mm -hmm. uh, in, in Pan Hill in the East, East End to uh, making a community garden behind Govan, Hill, Govan um, Town Hall to making a film about what, it, what it's like to... Um, be blind and negotiate um, the city centre. Oof. So you know it was that was very um, very grassroots up. Yeah. Um, the five spaces project was very much about working with five housing associations and uh, having a kind of co-working relationship around um, their client clienthood for those spaces. Mm -hmm. But of course they had to be delivered um, for ninety nine, and we also had um, quite high high powered artists working um, in, in a sense to uh, create a sort of genius loci for this for these places. Um, that was very had a very partial success and what I was doing in the in the writing was actually looking at why they were they succeeded or not. And why did they succeed? Well I would say some of them were less you know I, I, I suppose I concentrated on why they didn't succeed more okay. than anything else. Um, partly because uh, you know the, all the ingredients were there. You had very well qualified and well intentioned architects. You had um, communities that had stepped up to be, be the client mm -hmm. the, via their housing association. Mm -hmm. You had very thoughtful artists who were not so much engaged with putting up a, um, a monument, but um, in terms of interrogating the the maybe the the past history of the place. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, in Springburn, um, the there was a a, a site laid out uh, which was almost like the echo of the previous tenement that had been there before mm -hmm. um, but you know they were poetic in, in their conception but since there were no maintenance arrangements um, to speak of put in place by the council um, and because 
you know, in a year you don't you actually don't deliver a meaningful space. No. You have to take a lot longer to do that. There no, was a no lot year. of there was a lot of learning in that. Mm-hmm. And and I suppose if there if there was any um positive outcome for them from the writing it was the fact that um people quite liked the fact that I was quite candid about its successes as its failures as well as its successes. So how did the um, Community Development Trust at Nielsen come about. Tell us that story. Right. The, um, at the end of this little book, um, I was proposing something around the nature of um, what it is that makes a place work. And clearly, people make a place work. And if you have, if the high street or the main street has been deserted in favour of a shopping mall, or if people no longer, um, you know, want to um, go to the cinema in their main street but want to go to another another place out of town or if people don't have the money to spend on the things they used to spend money on um, you, the main street which is the main social con- condenser mm-hmm. is empty mm-hmm. um, if and that's going on all over absolutely. Scotland we've got the new sorry to interrupt you, but yeah. we've got the new town centre's first strategy yes. going on you know it's like let's get life back into well, our town centres I mean I don't want to be presumptuous, but that was the kind of stuff that I was thinking about at that point. Mm -hmm. What is the life of a place if the life has deserted it? What is the life of a place if 70% of the population, the people who have got most to offer in terms of being in the right age group and perhaps have the spending power, are working out of that place Mm -hmm. um, five five days out of seven? Mm -hmm. And so there's this left-behind population, some of whom are maybe, you know, uh, um, are being provided for uh, in Porty. Um, that there's a whole changing dynamic uh, of places, mm-hmm. and if you don't if you don't respect that and work with it, um, and perhaps create uh, an alternative condenser, as it were, um, you you you're you're whistling in the wind because you know you can have brave ideas about Barcelona, but that's not um, Nielsen. So you're very much trying to create a lubricant from taking a town or a village from the historical place that had people there living in a certain lifestyle and helping it transition into the future. Yes. Tell us what goes on in the bank. You bought a bank. Tell us about that and what goes on there. I I could just just, um, go back for a little minute because I think the difference between space to live, which is the organisation we set up first, Mm -hmm. it's effectively the same as the the Development Trust, but that, that title is important because what we were talking about in dis- sort of in contrast perhaps to other community groups was that we felt strongly that um, there had to be a grassroots led strategy for the place as a whole rather than saying we're going to buy a, we're going to buy a, a community hub okay um, and it was that um, that space planning spatial planning in the in the planning sense in the in the design and planning sense um, em- em- sort of informed by the life of the place. So you got people together. What was the process? Well, how did you listen to the voice of the community? Well, I s- basically stood up um, in January two thousand and four at two public meetings, which were packed, and said, "I've got this idea about space and living, and it all sounded very arcane and, and, and highfalutin." But there were enough people who said, "This is a quite unusual thing. I quite fancy this." Um, Nielsen's never has been overlooked for many years. Mm-hmm. It's undergone really radical change from being a mill town to being a commuter settlement Mm -hmm. and uh, the place is nothing special and we feel it could be better and so that was how we formed our first board and and you know 12 years later here we are are. so what's happened in those 12 years well that's why the the the, the first chapter as it were was the (coughs) was the creation space to live Mm -hmm. i'm making the argument having we had designers from uh, Copenhagen coming to us, talking, conducting workshops, talking about what might be in this place, how it could be um, re, re energized spatially. Um, and then along came the bank opportunity, and that's where uh, the, the, the community right to buy came in. Okay. And you know, if you're talking about business models and how to run a successful social enterprise, um, it, Nielsen is characterised by its serendipity rather than its um, effective business planning. <laughs> because because everybody. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, when we started up a space to live, we had a bank in Nielsen. Yeah. Nobody expected that bank to close. And suddenly we had this announcement. And the question was, 
what could I do about it? And um, we, we, without being too hasty, we, we swung into action and started to look at the possibility. But then we had to be very hasty because we had on our hands a late application for registration because the bank, the bank had already been marketed. Registration of? Need to write to buy. Okay. It's, a, it's a whole other chat show. And okay. you, you won't get many <laughs> people coming to oh, it. Yeah. <laughs> you can <laughs> ask for later. <laughs> it's pretty scary. Um, so, but you know, I should probably know the Community Empowerment Act is, is a lot about yes. extending those powers. Yeah. So, you know, in, at one level, um, you know, start here. If, if you want to talk about buying in, a, in, a, in an urban area, my plea would be that you're much more strategic about it mm -hmm. because we did the other way around. We had no other option. But now you have the opportunity to be strategic. And I think that's, a, a, that's a plea I would make to communities that are thinking about asset ownership. Do you think it matters whether a community buys assets or rents assets? I think there's a sort of enchantment with asset ownership which um, is really, um, I completely understand because uh, ownership is nine tenths of the law or whatever. Um, but Ten tenths of the law. Ten tenths of the law. <laughs> but, but what I think we've been trying to do in Neilston is to say um, there's a broad picture here. We have a place called this called Neilston. Um, we have social, environmental, and economic ambitions for this place. Mm -hmm. um, and so we really need to work with our local authority in a very creative partnership in order to start to pull down some of that control and ownership to, to nearer the grassroots. So it's the local by default maxim. Um, there should be much more pulled down to a scale of you know six to ten thousand, because that's when things get delivered effectively. The whole Scandinavian uh, model of so. uh, local accountability and Absolutely. delivering and budgeting, of course, yes. comes down to it. And we're, we're a long way from there, um, but and we're a long way from the kind of hand in glove relationship with our local authority that we would love to have. Mm. But I think we're probably a lot nearer it than some than some areas. So mm. what types of things? So I come back to that question. Yeah. What types of things happen? within the vicinity of the bank. It's called the bank. Why didn't you change the name? Because it was the bank. It was the bank. Everyone knew it was the bank. <laughs> and banking and Neilston was our slogan for, the, for oh, our lottery yeah, applications. Yeah, yeah. Good, yeah. And we've got yeah. a, and I've now got a um, sort of sub-office of the credit union mm -hmm. back in the village uh, through, we call it the bank card, and uh, that's working through the trust. Um, you know, we've just been a, a awarded silver for the Scotland's first community Cycle Friendly Community Award okay. uh, from Cycling Scotland. So there's a there's a the beginnings of social enterprise around cycling, um, and a, a, a cycle hub in the at the back in the backyard of the bank, mm -hmm. the cafe of course. We have spaces that I mean in effect we are co-working, but we've got not got very much space because if you can imagine the bank being a kind of old uh, established you know um, what what's the word um, when you have a a detached, detached house, yeah. a big detached house. That's the scale of it. Yeah. So we've got up, upstairs. We've got the, the trust office. We've got uh, the first responders. Our community first responders have a space. There's a local business have a little office. Um, and apart from that, we've just got two spaces downstairs. One of which is the cafe. So we're really hard pressed for space. So we can't actually extend very much. But we're at the point where we need to. Okay. Um, and any number, knitters, crafters, you know, um, Pilates classes, um, there's just so much going on that we're almost at capacity. So that's great, but, you know, we, need, we can go more. What do you think the impact of creating that, uh, you know, dare I say a venue, uh -huh. but of, of creating that space, what do, what's the impact on your community, do you think? What would it be like without it? Well, I think... I mean, it's there. It's on the it's on the main street. Um, it's loved by the people who use it. Um, it's we've got a long way to go in a place like Neilston. I mean, I envy Portobello. It's driving high social capital uh, 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 population. Um, we have that too, but I think people have got perhaps more pressing concerns. You know, Neilston's not terribly well off, and the people that are are better off are out working. So it's quite hard sometimes to get that engagement, you know, in terms of uh, board membership, volunteers. But I have to say, I mean, we've come a very long way and, um, 
you know, t t just the, the feedback you get from going into the, the bank and seeing what's happening. I have to say, though, resource is a massive issue. I mean, mm -hmm. my work was done on a, vo a volunteer basis. Um, you know, we have short-term funding for our chief officer. Without that chief officer bringing his business development skills into the mix, um, you know, and, and looking very, very hard at what we're doing. And this is with the, the, the income from a wind farm um, joint venture. You have you a know, wind farm as well as a bank. Yes. You're very well off. <laughs> well, I'd like to say think so, but uh, can, that's another story, another chat show. Um, but we'll make a series. <laughs> it, but it is, I mean, it's, it's without being funny, it's, it's actually what we've achieved has been all on the project side. Mm -hmm. Now we've got we've got to do is consolidate that into into a coherent business, mm -hmm. and um, you know we need we need the continuing resource, but we also need to negotiate strong relationships, productive and creative and imaginative relationships with our partners in the council. Um, I'm not going to I'm not going to vilify our local authority. They are very hard pressed, um, the, and they have to chase the money whatever it is. But you know without um, both um, in kind support in terms of making things happen mm -hmm. in just a wee bit more creative ways mm -hmm. and without a little bit of resource as well. That partnership is one, is, is, is a kind of, it's, it's not as productive as it might be. So, uh, you know, from where Danny is in the early stages of running a venue to where you are, it's been going 12 years. Um, it's well established in the community, but the, the business model is still scary. Yes. Always scary. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody knows it. Um, <clears throat> what tips and advice would you give to uh, people creating spaces in their local communities? Uh, how, you know, how do you sustain that level of ambition and hope? Hope's a very good word. I think if you didn't, if you, if there weren't the the well, there wasn't the feedback and the reinforcement of your ambitions from you know having good people around you that I mean I cannot we could not be where we are today without without uh, there's maybe half a dozen people that have been with this since the start um, and my colleague Laura Carr as well particularly is um, has given her all to this project as well so that is, is getting a group of people who really have really got it and are willing to stick with it mm -hmm. is one thing um, what would I say be realistic about what you can uh, give to the project. Um, if I had known, you know, would I be, would I be sitting here, um, twelve years on, if I'd known how hard it was going to be? Um, but yet, there's this incredible reinforcement that comes from doing it. Um, so I think, and I think also to my plea is that, you know, people like myself have been in a position where I could do this crazy thing. There are plenty of places where people have got very pressing concerns much nearer to home mm -hmm. and, and can't, despite all their passion about their place, mm -hmm. can't actually give that time. Um, and I suppose I'm concerned that um, in places like Porty and Neilston and, and, and so on, you know, there's always some loony around the place <laughs> that's got that drive. Um, Are you that loony? <laughs> I think I have to be. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, whereas there are other places that, um, you know, would look at Nielsen and say that would be great to do, and yet the, 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 the just isn't the resource around. Um, so I'm worried that when we get big pats on the back for being an enterprising community, mm -hmm. um, in a sense it kind of isolates us from the communities that for whatever reason haven't been able to get there yet. Um, and that, that concerns me, I have to say, that, you know, how many loonies there are spread around the place. You know? So we're going to switch the word loony for leader. <laughs> <laughs> You've shown very strong leadership. There's no loonies in the room here. No, no, no. Um, <coughs> leadership challenges. What, what are some, give us some of the leadership challenges you've personally experienced over the time. Well, I think if you do something in your own community, um, you are, your motives and uh, your own passion is sometimes seen as suspect mm -hmm. um, and I think if there have been if there have been any hard times and I think I mean there have been very hard times it's when um, you feel that you haven't communicated successfully the <laughs> uh, integrity of, of what you're trying to do um, because people don't expect you to jump up in your own place and suggest um, 
exotic initiatives. <laughs> um, uh, you know, that there's always that sense of hmm, kind of feather, or, you know. Um, uh, so. Uh, they don't, didn't actually. Don't, don't put your head above the parapet. They don't. Kid, they didn't make no. my fear. Uh, no. but, but I'm from the East End of Glasgow. They didn't make my fear. Um, <laughs> but maybe I was an interloper. That's for, for foreigners. That means that you haven't lived in your, you haven't your generations of uh, past. You know, grandparents haven't come from the place. Forty years is not enough. No, forty years is Oof. not enough. So I mean, I don't, I don't buy that stuff, and not many people come away with that. I have to say, this is going on YouTube. This is not the way people think. Um, but uh, there is sometimes that. And what you have to be it, to find in yourself is a generosity to understand that and to say there are many ways of looking at this place. If you believe in placemaking as a place of social interaction uh, where people's passions are engaged around where they've belonged, where their great-great-grandfather came from, um, you know, this sweetie shop that they're their auntie ran and that you didn't know about and yeah. um, that is legitimate and so people the, the, the proposing change is always is always going to be challenging um, and so while you may feel that you've got the courage personally to propose that change um, there are other people who have to be listened to in a way that is not just about um, not just about uh, patting them on the head and saying you've been consulted. Real integrity. Yeah, and and you know you may feel you're you are entering into that conversation with integrity and intelligence and generosity. That may not be how they construe it, mm -hmm. and I think that makes actually that 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 makes for people um, withdrawing into their little um, silos. And maybe that's how we get to the point where you have siloed government, and while where you know the pain of being on the front line is almost we construct institutions that protect us from that. So that is the testing ground, I think, and what you know what requires continual refreshment, refreshment of your um, energy and generosity, you know, it, to it, to be able to engage with that and uh, probably that will be the test of our movement really. So being a loony leader requires integrity, generosity, intelligence and keeping going by the sound of it. 12 years, getting a core group of people around and uh, having that vision, <coughs> listening to the community, taking that forward. Yes. yes. Pauline, thank you very much for your sharing with us this evening. Congratulations in all your work and I wish you well for the future. Thank you.